Okay, it's time for another podcast. This week we're going to be talking about Hoyne's method plus keeping track of a state as a vector. One question is, what's wrong with Euler's method? We worked it out. It worked pretty well. Why do we need a new one? Well, the truth is that Euler's method uh, is okay as long as you have a simple problem and it doesn't have uh, a lot of complexity. If you add complexity and you also have a situation where uh, the equations are a little bit pathological, Euler's method can be very difficult to use to achieve good results. So instead, we're going to use Hoyne's method, at least as a next step, which improves on Euler's method by not requiring quite a small a time step to get reasonable results. We'll see that in a minute. First of all, let's imagine we have a, a differential equation that we want to solve with Euler's method or with Hoyne's method, and it can be represented as a slope field, which you guys are familiar with. The idea is the slope field represents the slope at different values of x and t. And uh, so, for example, x1 would be the first value of x, and to go out to the next value of x, you'd have to extrapolate using the slope at the current value of x. So we pop over to an extrapolated value, and we evaluate the slope there. In Euler's method, we'd be done. But with Hoyne's method, we take the slope at the end of the x interval and use it to extrapolate again. Make a second guess using the slope at the end of the interval, and then use the average of the two slopes to get a final extrapolation. And that's our final result. Let's go that step by step. Uh, first, we get the slope at x1. We evaluate f at s and x. Then we extrapolate over to x2 and get the value of the slope there. Notice we use the slope at the first value of x to figure out where to evaluate the slope for the second value of x. Then we, uh, we get the second slope. And... Uh, we evaluate the second slope at s2 and at x2. And finally, the best guess is, you, is achieved by using the average of the two slopes. That's the idea. That's Hoyne's method. Now, Hoyne's method is second order. What that means is the size of the error in the method goes like the time step size squared. Euler's method, in contrast, is first order. Let's make a graph of the error using Hoyne's method and Euler's method and see how the error varies with step size. The root mean square error as a function of step size, actually it's the log of the root mean square error as a function of the log of the step size, for Hoyne's method is shown here in blue and Euler's method is shown in green. There's also a straight line fit. Notice that Euler's method is that the log of the error goes like uh, it, it's like one times the log of the time step, and the uh, Hoyne's method, it goes like two times the log of the time step. That means that the it really goes like the square of the time step. Okay. Um, note that having the time step using Euler's method reduces the error in proportion by half, but reducing the time step using Hoyne's method reduces the error by a factor of four. If you have the time step, you get a factor of four in reduction in error. So by doubling the number of time steps, you get four times the accuracy. Of course, it also takes more work for each time step, so it's not totally free. Now the next thing is, what if we've got a more complicated problem? Uh, what if the state requires more information than just a single number? And what if DSDT is a much more involved thing? How do we handle that complexity? The answer is, we use the concept of a vector. A vector is an object that keeps multiple components together as a single package. They can be differentiated and multiplied and divided and added just like numbers. And not only that, there's a very nice array package that comes with Python that, uh, or that you can add easily to Python that makes implementing operations with vectors very easy. Let's work out an example using Euler's method and Hoyne's method. Consider a mass on a spring that could be modeled as a simple harmonic oscillator with damping. The differential equation, it's basically Newton's second law, would look something like this. Notice it's got weight, it's got a spring force, 
and it's got a damping force. This is laminar damp laminar drag, basically, proportional to velocity. The thing is, the velocity and position are mixed together in Newton's second law, so that the state needs to know both things. It needs two numbers to predict the future. It needs to know the current position, and it needs to know the current velocity. So how do we deal with that? We think of state as a vector. The function f is now a vector function that accepts a vector state and returns a vector rate of change of state with time. But it's not a vector like a position vector or a velocity vector. It's an abstract mathematical vector. Its first component is the position. Its second component is the velocity. If we use Euler's method to estimate what happens, all we have to do is evaluate the derives function, just like we did before, and multiply by the change in time. Now look at that Euler step, and tell me if it looks familiar. It should, because it's the same as it was before. It hasn't changed at all. The only difference is we know now s is a vector, derives is a vector, and um, it returns a, a vector. So that makes it easy. What about the derives function? It's a little different now. Derives now gets passed in the current state and the current time, but remember the state is now a vector, so we need to fish out the first component and the second component of the state vector to calculate the rate of change of the state. The first element of the rate of change of the state is the rate of change of the position. The second element in the rate of change of the state is the rate of change of velocity. Those are, of course, just the velocity and the acceleration. The main loop now looks something like this. It's quite simple. It looks a lot like the main loop did when the state wasn't a vector. And uh, notice that uh, if all we care about is the state, this main loop is all we need. Now if we want to save the results of our calculation, a list is a great way to do that. So you can make a list of values of the various elements of the state vector and use them later to make a graph. So for example, we can start a Y list, a time list, and a V list, put initial values in to get things started, and then during the loop, we can just throw the latest value of Y, the latest value of V, and the latest value of T into those lists, accumulating a list of values of Y, T, and V. At the beginning, we also need to start up the state vector, and the array constructor, it's part of PyLab, the array constructor is just called array, and you pass it a list of the things that you want in the array. And that's all there is to it. Now, what about a Hoyne step? Well, that's quite easy as well. It's very similar to the last time we did a Hoyne step. It's, uh, you evaluate the function at one value of s and t, then you jump over to the next value of t, evaluate the function again there, and then return the average. Easy peasy. Here's a graph of the position and velocity of the oscillator using the Hoyne method, the exact result, and the Euler method. Notice that the exact result and Hoyne's method are almost on top of each other using the same time step in which the Euler method it produces a pretty crummy result. It's quite different from the exact solution. So for just a little more work, you can get much greater accuracy using Hoyne's method. And that's all there is.